Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm not used to giving this kind of talk, so I had to give it some thought. Um, why do we read? I prefer to use it, make it as a question as opposed to a statement, why we read, because actually I don't know. Um, fewer and fewer of us do read, and sometimes I'm afraid that at some point in the near future, practically nobody will. I, I was at a reading recently where somebody asked me what I thought of jo a statement John Updike made in an interview, um, saying that the novel is dead, shortly after which he died. Huh. <laughs> um, she wanted to know what I thought about that. Um, and I answered with a story which is not on the subject of writing, but which made sense to me. It's a story about a classical musician. Um, classical music is, I wouldn't say it's dead, but it's no longer a big part of the um, cultural picture. It's not in the common talk, not in popular culture. It's not as alive and fiery as it once was. Um, and the story I told is about a classical musician named Joshua Bell, who some people consider to be the best musician in America. He, um, when you go see him play, you're going to pay $100 for the cheap seats. He plays on a $3 million violin. And as an experiment, he decided to be a subway musician for an afternoon or a morning, I think it was. Um, he, he showed up, that this was videotaped. And he started out with a piece by Bach, which many people consider to be the most, one of the greatest pieces of music ever written. I don't remember the name of it, sorry. I can't remember anything. It's also considered one of the hardest to play. Um, and almost nobody looked at him. Forget about stopping. Almost nobody looked. They just, and like tons and tons of people pouring through. Um, three people stopped out of over a thousand. And most of the people who really looked were little kids. I mean, three, four, five-year-old kids going <laughs> as their mothers dragged them, <laughs> dragged them away at top speed. Um, he made, in case you're wondering, $32, mostly in change. <laughs> and the highest compliment that he may have been paid was by a shoeshine woman who said that she normally, she's interviewed, she said she would normally call the police on these people because she hated them. But this guy was okay, <laughs> so she didn't call the cops on him. So in answering that woman's question, is, is this music dead? When we look, there was some comment made on the person who wrote the article, which I think was in the Times, that I actually read on the internet with the video, um, um, that when you watch it, it's almost like he's a ghost, because he's playing his heart out. And these people are just rushing by for the most part. Even the people who stopped, don't they? I think only one person stopped for the whole thing and, and actually did it wonder, is that Joshua Bell? One person did wonder that. Um, but it, you could look at it the other way. You could look at it as, here's a human being, and all these people are, these, these ghosts are just going by, they can't hear him. So back to the question, why we read? would be an easier question to answer in the past before TV, movies, internet. Reading was the only way for an educated person. And bear in mind, most people did not read. For most of human history, most of humanity did not read. That's something we tend to forget. But for an educated, literate person, it was the way to receive practical, emotional, political, or for lack of a better word, mystical information, to know the subjectivity of another human. A lot of competition now, um, not just in the form of TV and movies and music, but also the internet, which isn't just competition for time and space, but it's actually a much more serious challenge, which I'll return to later. Movies and video are powerfully different from uh, written art, and there are obvious things that the written story can do that film cannot. The most obvious is that a written story can inhabit um, an individual vision far more intensely and deeply than film is able to do. Also in terms of world, world vision. Imagine a film of Charles Dickens' Bleak House, which opens with a description of London Street. There it would be, the city of London, the panorama, the buildings, the horses and buggies, the pedestrians, the dogs, the fog, the heavy fog, 
the sky, in the distance maybe trees. It would be a beautiful scene. But listen to this. London. Michael Mass term lately over and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall, implacable November weather. As much mud in the streets as if the waters but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs, undistinguishable in mire. Horses, scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers. Foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas, in general, in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners, where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenacious, tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog <coughs> everywhere. Fog up the river where it flows among green eights and meadows. Fog down the river where it rolls, rolls defiled among the tiers of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marches, fog on the Kentish Heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs, fog lying out of the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships, fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich, Greenwich pensioners wheezing by the firesides of their wards, fog in the stem and bowl of an afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper down in his close cabin, fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck, Chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into another sky of fog, with fog all round them as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Gas looming through the fog in diverse places in the streets, much as the sun may from the spongy fields be seen to loom by husband and plowboy. Most of the shops lighted two hours before their time, as the gas seems to know, for it has a haggard and unwilling look. Peter Jackson, <laughs> suck on that. <laughs> Camera can show a lot. It can show you historical London. If the director is clever, he can show you also close-ups of individuals. He could show you some of those people that I mentioned. I don't know if he could show you the insides of their throats and pipes, but he could show you their faces. But would he show you a megalosaurus? He could. But it would be a strange and ineffective gesture if it were not repeated in a way that was congruent with the plot. Film's great strength that it has over fiction is its sense-based vermicillitude. In a glance, it can show you an entire world that a writer must labor for at least a page, most likely pages, to create word by torturous word. But vermicillitude is also its weakness, even, even with special effects. It's hard for a film to bend reality, blend it, to show its polymcist nature without being literal and comparatively oafish. Dickens did this with suppleness and speed and in a few phrases. Uh, here's another example where he's describing a lawsuit that is ruining everyone's life, all the characters' lives, jarndice and jarndice, nightmare, gone on for decades. Scores of people have found, deliriously found themselves made parties in Jarndyce and Jarndyce without knowing how or why. Whole families have inherited legendary hatreds with the suit. The little plaintiff or defendant who was promised a new rocking horse when Jarndyce and Jarndyce should be settled has grown up, possessed himself of a real horse, and trotted away into another world. Fair wards of court have faded into mothers and grandmothers. A long procession of chancellors has come in and gone out. The legion of bills in the suit has been transformed into mere bills of mortality. There are not three Jarndyces left upon the earth, perhaps, since old Tom Jarndyce in despair blew his brains out in a coffee house in Chancery Lane. But Jarndyce and Jarndyce still drags its dreary length before the court, perennially hopeless. 
Well, talk about this again, the suppleness and speed. We go from a rocking horse to a real horse to a phantom horse riding into another world in a sentence. We go through generations and an unknown character who's never going to appear blowing his brains out in a coffee shop in a few phrases. I remember back in the 90s reading about the internet was coming into being very strong and CD-ROMs were a bit of a fashion. And there was some talk in San Francisco about how this was going to kick writers' ass because it was going to be non-linear. <laughs> you were going to like click on a link and go somewhere totally different. You weren't going to have to like read sentences. You were going to like click on this link and a box was going to come open. And I was like really nervous at first, and then I finally saw it and clicked, and I was like, <laughs> "You're joking, right?" <laughs> Writers have been doing that forever, like that. Um, anyway. The film opening of Bleak House would almost of necessity be based on a shared understanding of what London is or was. And that doesn't include Bengalosaurus's. What Dickens wrote has nothing to do with that shared understanding. He gave us his London, which did not exist until he wrote it. It exists now. It exists as part of our conception of London, but it wasn't there before he wrote it. I mean, and don't get me wrong, I, I, a shared understanding can be a beautiful thing, but writing does something else. I mean, it may include the shared understanding, but what makes it really extraordinary is that something else 